Yes. Welcome to the start of class. So we're going to continue an idea that was presented on Monday, where it was suggested that we use some kind of minimality principle to get to the best solution. And so, you know, I thought a little bit more about the problem. I've given you a post where I've written up a nice way of attacking the two-dimensional problem, and I'm leaving the higher dimensional analog for you as a nice exercise. But the idea that was suggested, and you're going to do a little bit of work to make it rigorous, was this idea of a minimality. That we look at all pairs of semicircles, and we choose the two that has the smallest sector arc omitted. And then we somehow show that there must be another semicircle that entirely covers that sector arc, and then those three are the three ones we need. Or if not, we could get a smaller sector that's not covered. And that's this kind of minimality principle. Hopefully you have seen this before. Anybody have any idea where you might have seen this minimality idea before, this proof before? It's one of the most famous theorems in existence. Yes? Uh, in what sense? Uh, it does involve, in some sense, division, but... Uh, I, I think in abstract algebra, proving a division algorithm, like, the, with the quotient remainder, right. there's a, a minimality... Oh, the Euclidean you algorithm? Order, you order a set so that you have a, a minimal number. So that, um, okay, yes. Yeah. So, so I, I think somewhere around there, you will see a minimality, Euclidean algorithm, stuff like that. Excellent choice. Something a little bit more basic. One of the very first theorems you should ever see in mathematics, and it just stressed some ancient dead Greeks. The Pythagorean. The, uh, okay, what's the Pythagorean? Which Pythagorean? Or which Pythagorean theorem? It's not a squared plus b squared equals c squared, although it's related to that. The other one? The other one, which is? <laughs> yes, it's like the old joke, the Iliad and the Odyssey were not written by Homer, they were written by another blind deaf Greek of the same name. Root 2 is irrational. So root 2 is irrational is probably the first example of where you would see this method of descent. All right, method of descent. So square root of 2 is irrational. And so what that means is there does not exist. So when you write an E like this, this means there exists. If you put a line through it, it means there does not exist. There does not exist A and B integers such that square root of 2 equals a over b. And so this distressed some mathematicians that you could start off with integers and have a process that would give you a non-integer. So what process am I thinking of that starts off with integers and gives me a non-integer? Well, square root. okay. Where am I getting the square root of 2? Geometrically, where is it coming from? Yes, yes. Raising your hand like this is a good way to do it. If I take an equilateral triangle of sides 1 and 1, then the Pythagorean theorem tells me that that's square root of 2. And so you can start off with two integers, a right triangle. One of the most natural things you can do, you connect the extremes. And when you connect them, you actually get something that's not an integer. You get, well, that's fine. You know, I get rational numbers all the time. But you get something that's not even rational. And so the question is, how do you prove the square root of 2 is irrational? There's lots of different ways of doing this. I'm going to show you one of the standard ways, and then I'm going to show you a non-standard way that will actually open up some research projects. So if anybody wants to try their hand at a research problem, here is one. So proof. Assume square root of 2 equals a over b, a and b are integers. And now there's two different ways of doing this. I can assume various things about A and B. What would be a good thing to assume about A and B? Yes? One is that they're relatively prime. Because if A and B are both divisible by 5, why not throw away that factor of 5? What else could I assume? Yes? B can't be 0. B can't be 0. But what else can I assume about B? I'm sorry? Uh, B will not be greater than A because I want to get root 2. B, B better be greater than 1. Yes? Smallest possible. And B is 
the smallest possible. So for example, and I'm, I'm going to erase this immediately because this is absurd, maybe 14 over 11 equals 141 over 101 equals square root of 2. Okay. This is of course not true. Okay, But maybe something like that holds. Maybe I have multiple ways of writing square root of 2 as a ratio of two integers. Among all the possible ways of writing it as a ratio of two integers, let's choose the one that has the denominator smallest. Okay? Could there be multiple ways that have the same smallest denominator? No. I'm going to assume maybe they're positive numbers. So, okay. The next thing, and you have to be a little bit careful sometimes, is if I look at all the possible ways of writing square root of 2 as a ratio of 2 integers, does there have to be one with the smallest denominator? Or maybe there is no one with the smallest denominator. Maybe you give me one and I can always find one with the smaller denominator. Okay, why must there be one with the smallest denominator? Okay, so now we're using some big math results. Okay, so claim if square root of 2 equals a over b must have a ratio with smallest b. And here's essentially a proof. Say a naught over b naught equals square root of 2. The only competitors are 1, 2, to b naught minus 1. So we just have to check those numbers. Okay? So if you look at all the ways of writing square root of 2 as a over b, there must be one with smallest possible denominator. And this is the whole idea of the method of descent, is that you start off with a minimal solution and you show that you can find a solution that's even more minimal. Can you have something more minimal than the minimalist? No. So that means we must have made a mistake. What's the mistake we made? I'm sorry? One is that it wasn't minimal. And so, since a minimal solution must exist, the, is, the mistake is that there was a solution. So this is the contradiction we're going to get, is we're going to assume that root 2 can be written as a over b, and that it can be written as a over b. Well, great. I'll choose among all the possible solutions. I'll choose the one that has smallest denominator. I will then find a new way of writing square root of 2 with an even smaller denominator. And that will be a contradiction because I've already chosen the one with the smallest. This is one of the most powerful proof techniques we have. So it's a proof by contradiction. It's through this method called infinite descent. OK. So now let's do the proof. OK. So proof. So we have square root of 2 equals a over b. What would you love to do at this point? You've got square root of 2 equals a over b. You should be desiring to do something. Square both sides, right? We don't like square roots. So this is the same as 2 equals a over b, or I'm sorry, a squared over b squared, or a squared equals 2 b squared. What can you deduce? So, so you want to deduce a is even. Amazingly, this requires work. And if you look at what the Greeks did, there's a lot of really good discussion about which numbers did the Greeks prove were irrational. I think I've read some things they stopped like the square root of 17. Because if you have you know, a squared equals 17 b squared, you want to then say 17 divides a squared, so 17 divides a. What you want to use is if a prime divides a product, the prime has to divide at least one of the factors. So p prime, p divides xy, implies p divides x, or p divides y. 
If a prime divides a product, it divides one of the factors. If I drop the constraint that p is a prime, must this be true? No. So 6 divides 3 times 4, but 6 does not divide 3, and 6 does not divide 4. So it's essential that I'm talking about a prime. What we're using here is every number has a unique representation as a product of prime powers. And in fact, this allows you to do something about 1. What must be true about the number 1? So if every number can be written uniquely as a product of prime powers, what must be true about 1? What kind of number is it not? It's not prime. Because if 1 were a prime, I would not have a unique way of writing numbers. I could write 6 as 1 to the 2014 times 2 times 3, or 1 to the 1793 times 2 times 3. I would have multiple ways of writing a number. Some of you may have heard the definition of a prime number is a number whose factors are only one in itself. If that's your definition, is one prime? Yes. If you say a number is prime, if its only factors are one in itself, then you have just declared one is prime. Are you allowed to declare one to be prime? No. You do not have the mathematical uh, declaration card that allows you to do something like that. You can create a new word if you want, and you can use it, but the word prime has been copyrighted. Okay? It cannot be used in this situation. One is special, one is called a unit. And it just makes a lot of things much cleaner if we don't consider one a prime number. And so we say a number is prime if it is greater than one, and its only factors are one in itself. All right? So here, if you are comfortable with this fact, we can immediately conclude A is even. If we're not comfortable with that fact, we have to do a little bit more work. So there are two possibilities. A equals 2 times m, or A equals 2m plus 1. In this case, I would get A squared is 4m squared, or A squared is 4m squared plus 4m plus 1. This is 2 times 2m squared plus 2m plus 1. Does 2 divide this? No, what's the remainder? 1. one. Does 2 divide this? Yes. So since 2 divides a squared, you must have a equals 2m for some m. Okay, that's the key observation. And we can prove this special case of if a prime divides a product, then the prime has to divide one of the two factors. We can prove it by brute force. If instead of 2, if we had the prime was 3, could we do this argument? Could we do it for 5, for 7, for the first prime after a million? Yes, but it's becoming more and more unpleasant, and there's more and more cases to check. And this is where what course might be useful. Abstract algebra, number theory, one of those courses would be useful in getting this general statement. If a prime divides a product, then the prime divides either the first factor or the second factor or both. In this special case, we can just do it by brute force. OK, any questions on where we are so far? Yes? Where did you get the or A equals 2M? Oh, well, I'm saying there are two possibilities for A. A is even or A is odd. Okay. And so one of these two has to hold. Which of the two holds? Well, because I know a squared is twice b squared, I have to have a equals 2 times m. OK. So let's continue. So now we know a equals 2m and a squared equals 2b squared. Thus, a squared is 4m squared is 2b squared. We remove the 2. And that gives us that 2m squared equals b squared. Well, now that we know that 2m squared equals b squared, what do we get? 2 divides b. So the same logic now implies b is even. So maybe we write b equals 2n. And so now we get 
the square root of 2 is a over b. a was 2m, b was 2n. So it's the same as m over n. And what do we know about n? n is less than b. As n is less than b, violates <coughs> minimality of b. And that's the proof. OK? Therefore, the square root of 2 is irrational. If you wanted to do the other proof, choose a and b relatively prime, the proof is essentially the same. And then at this point, you would say, oh, well, 2 divides a and 2 divides b. This violates a and b being relatively prime. All right. So the proofs are very similar. I wanted to phrase this as a method of descent, because that's a nice proof technique. And you know, it ties with what we did on Monday. And it shows you that you assume you have something with a minimal property, and then you find that you can find something even more minimal. Therefore, your assumption was false. Okay. Any questions about this? How many of you have seen this proof before or a close cousin of this? Okay. Uh, how many of you know that as a math or a stats major, you have to give a colloquium talk to graduate? For those of you who don't know, uh, this is often a terrifying moment when people realize they have to do this, but it's one of the things that students, for the most part, love after the fact. And the key word is after. You know, beforehand, not so much. But after the fact, it's one of the most useful things in their college experiences. And we, and we get this almost uniformly on the evaluations, possibly because we sometimes prime you by saying people uniformly find it useful after the fact. And you hear that for years and years and years, and you start you know, getting programmed. But you know, again, as I've said, if you're not going to be a professional mime, you're going to be speaking. You need to learn how to talk. You need to learn how to present. You need to learn how to organize material. A couple of years ago, somebody was giving a colloquium on six different proofs of the irrationality of square root of 2. And they gave the following one. And this idea is due to Tenenbaum. And it's a geometric proof. So imagine the square root of 2 equals a over b, and b is minimal. OK? Then what do you want to do? Surely you haven't changed so much in 10 minutes. What's your first instinct when you see this? Square. Squared. All right, so we still have 2. We'll move it over. We get 2b squared equals a squared. Give me a geometric interpretation of this statement. Yes? Nope. Nope. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you have a square okay. side length A, then you can fit inside it twice a square side length B. Right. So I might have to chop up um, the square of side length B a little bit. But if I chop up the square of side length B, I can put two of them in here without having any leftover space and filling up everything perfectly and without putting anything in the same place twice. Where would be a good place to put one of my squares? Corner. corner. All right. It doesn't really matter which corner, so I'll do this one over here. I actually have a proof of this using fused beads. Unfortunately, I left it in my office. Where should I put the next one? Is there any way to get the next one in? No. So I'm going to also put it in a corner. What would be a good corner? Opposite. All right. So this is going to be B. All right. So let's think about what we have. This, rec this square of side length B plus this square of side length B has the same area as the initial square of side length A. I've double counted this region. How many times have I counted these regions? None. So what can you tell me? Yes. 
Okay, so in, in words, geometrically, what can you the area of that center has to be? The area of the center is equal to the area of these two parts over here. Because I've gotten this twice, I haven't gotten these at all, so the extra time I got this has to equal those two. So now I just have to figure out what the dimensions are. Well, if this whole thing is A, this length over here has to be B minus A. Right? And now if this is B minus A, and this is b minus a, what's the length of this one over here? So I've got a minus 2b minus a. <coughs> so I think it becomes 2b minus a. As a check, I'm sorry, um, no, a minus 2b, it's a minus 2b. And if you check, if you add them up, b minus a plus a minus 2b plus b minus a is a. So we get that a minus 2b squared is equal to 2 times b minus a squared. So the square root of 2 is equal to a minus 2b over b minus a. And we've just written b, I'm sorry, we've just written square root of 2 as a ratio of two integers. Is this a contradiction? Why is this a contradiction? Yes? Because now you have a smaller denominator whenever you say b is in the whole thing. How do you know it's a smaller denominator? <laughs> because a has to be positive. Mm -hmm. And so you took b and you subtracted something off from it. Oh, so wait a minute. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This should, this should be. Sorry, wait a minute. I think we wrote the wrong things. This is a minus, this is a minus b. b minus right. And that's why I was writing. Sorry. Now that one I can't redo the recording easily. So it's 2b minus a. So it changes in minor ways, you know. Blah, blah. All right, so now we get 2b minus a. We get a minus b. So now we get 2b minus a over a minus b. So the denominator is clearly smaller than a. But is the denominator smaller than b? We need the denominator to be smaller than b for minimality. So if a minus b is less than b, we win. So if not, then a minus b is greater than or equal to b. So a is greater than or equal to 2b. So a squared is greater than or equal to 4b squared, so a squared over b squared is greater than or equal to 4. I think this was actually overkill. Yeah, yeah over here I could have just said a over b is greater than or equal to 2, which is greater than square root of 2. That's enough to, I, I don't need to do all this stuff. This was overkill. So it's, it's, it's fun to square. There's no need to square. All right, so at this point, once I have a is greater than or equal to 2b, I immediately get that a over b is greater than or equal to 2, I am using the deep fact that 2 is greater than square root of 2. There's a limit to how far down we'll go in our proofs. And here is another minimality. And so this is a geometric proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. What I really like about this is if you look back to the, you know, the proof you've seen before about the square root of 2, this is what the Greeks did. And they got stuck around square root of 17 because they just got bored. Even with slaves that you can give stuff like this, the slaves, I guess, were not mathematically talented enough to keep going. It's time consuming. You want a good way of handling these things. This is where abstract algebra and number theory come into play. Over here, we just proved the square root of 2 is irrational. Did we ever have a divisibility condition? Did we ever have a you know, prime dividing a product? This is a different proof. All right, so because this is being recorded, I will have to be a little bit careful now. What are you supposed to do at colloquia when you're in the audience? Ask no. I mean, you are supposed to do that, be but quiet. be quiet and listen. listen, right? Your full attention is supposed to be on the speaker, right? It would have been very wrong if one of my colleagues 
quietly said to me during the talk, it's a shame that this proof only works for square root of 2. Just like it would have been wrong if immediately after the talk ended, I handed them a napkin or a piece of paper where it's something like this drawn. Uh, horribly drawn, but what do you think this shows? Screw root of 3 is irrational. It is you have these twice, you miss the middle. And this would give you square root of 3 is irrational. What about square root of 4? All right, square root of 4 we're not going to get. Square root of 5. What shape do you think might be useful? Pentagon. Pentagon. And so with one of my small students uh, many years ago, we actually got uh, the Pentagon to work putting pentagons inside pentagons. And I'll send you the paper. What about square root of 6? Yeah. No. Yes? Excellent. Why not a hexagon? Because I've seen your talk. <laughs> I don't know whether or not you can get a hexagon to work. I haven't gotten a hexagon to work. I haven't played with it too carefully. I hope somebody here will be excited enough to try this. So we can continue the triangle and um, I think it's, it's, it's something like this. And then, you know, I, I, I'll get it wrong if I try to do this. You can get square root of 6. You can also get square root of 10. So we have the numbers 1, oh, so not 1, sorry, 3, 6, 10. Anybody recognize these numbers? They're the triangle numbers. Where do triangle numbers come from? Triangles, right? <laughs> yes. Sometimes the names are good. Okay? The triangle numbers are coming from triangles. You know, one dot, then you add two dots, then you add three dots, then you add four dots. And the triangle numbers is just something like that. So one, three, six, ten, fifteen. What do you think the next number we should be able to prove using triangles is has an irrational square root? Fifteen. And then? And then? And then? So do you think we can prove all triangle numbers have irrational square roots? Yes. How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, how many say no who have not read the paper? It's absolutely fine that you've read the paper. Okay, why not? You get to 36. So how do I get to 36? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, I'm at 10, 15, 21, 28, 36. Last time I checked, 36 was 6 squared. OK? What does that mean? It means that this triangle proof is fundamentally going to break down at some point. So I, I, I find this absolutely fascinating. This is one of the reasons why I'm a mathematician. Because yeah, things like this excite me. You have a method of proof that will work up to a certain point, and we can even quantify a little bit where it breaks down. That at some point, when we're trying to do these conditions, something goes haywire. So if anybody is interested in massive extra credit and getting a publication, try to see if you can push these methods further. I will provide a link to this paper. Can you prove other numbers are irrational? And what I like about this is, in the ancient Greek proof, the reason they don't have the square root of 19 as irrational is because they were fundamentally lazy. Okay? Here, it's not that we're fundamentally lazy. Something fundamentally goes wrong at a certain point. It is a method that works up to a certain point and then breaks down. To me, whenever that happens, something interesting is going on. Yes? Do we know that it breaks down for all the finitely many triangle numbers? Uh, nope. I, there's many things I deliberately do not think about and leave for the students. So it would be wonderful if you could prove there are infinitely many numbers that can be proven to be irrational using this method. And instead of proving things like the square root of 2 is irrational, what else might you want to do? What would be another good question?
So instead of doing square root of 2 or square root of 3, cube roots, can you come up with a geometric proof that the cube root of 2 is irrational? I do not know of a geometric proof yet where people have been able to make that work. But that would be a fascinating thing to see. So again, if anybody is interested in pursuing some of these lines, there's a lot of really good, fun problems here um, that I think people would be interested in seeing how far could you push these arguments. All right. I will say one more thing about method of descent, because if I don't say this, you know, again, I don't get to go to heaven when I die. When you're teaching method of descent, you always have to mention a certain equation. Which equation? Anybody know? One of the most famous equations that you cannot solve unless you do you know, trivial, stupid solutions. Fermat's last theorem. And in fact, the abbreviation of this is capital FLT. There's also Fermat's little theorem, which is spelled with a lowercase l. And in fact, that's the inspiration for the name of this course, where I had to make sure that the registrar had the lowercase l in the title for the little questions. So x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. No non-stupid solutions if n is greater than or equal to 3. What's a stupid solution? Take something to be 0. It's not hard to solve if you take x to be 0. Essentially, that's the only way you can solve it if n is greater than or equal to 3. Any Simpson fans? OK, what episode am I thinking of? Where we write something with like 12 powers. On yes. Each other. Which episode was that? Anybody know? This was one of the Simpson. I'm sorry? No. It was one of the Halloween episodes where it was 3D Homer, and he falls into the third dimension. And they have a bunch of math things floating on in the background. And one of them was an almost solution to Fermat's last theorem with an exponent, I believe, of 12. And the numbers are really close, but they just don't quite work. So one way to attack this is the method of descent. So using method of descent, no solutions to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared. Well, really, we're supposed to have z to the fourth. z to the fourth would be z squared squared. So in fact, this is even more general. So if you weaken it a little bit, you still can't get a solution. And this is done using the method of descent. I'm not going to go through the details you basically assume there exists a solution, and you start playing some kind of congruence games, and you get that there's another solution that's even smaller. So when we have a solution here, we maybe measure the size of the solution based on z. So you assume there's a solution, you choose the solution that has smallest value of z, and then you find that there is a solution that has a smaller value of z. Okay, so this is the method of descent. So now we have a bunch of proof techniques. We have method of descent, we have induction, uh, proof by contradiction, we have uh, the arithmetic mean, geometric mean, which really will not help us unless we have inequalities floating around. Okay. Any questions on method of descent before I go to a problem from the class? Okay. So again, I appreciate everybody who sends me the emails about which problems you find interesting. Okay, it makes it a lot easier for me, makes it at least more interesting for one of you. And so somebody sent me the following problem. Imagine you have a circle, because all the geometry problems seem to involve circles, and you have n red dots and n blue dots. You know, we don't have, oh, I do have yellow chalk. And I, oh, no, no, I'm not teaching in here after this. I actually get to see daylight. So. So imagine we have something like this. All right, and so red will also be known as white, and blue will also be known as yellow. All right, so the new blue is yellow. And the goal is starting at some point, you walk clockwise, 
and you want to walk clockwise in such a way that if you keep track of how many yellow dots and how many white dots you see, you've never seen more yellow dots than white dots. Okay, so clearly if you start over here, you start off with one white dot, then one yellow dot, you're okay, it's one to one, and then over here it's bad, you have more yellow dots than white dots. If I start off over here, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's bad. If I start off here, it's bad. If I start off here, I'm okay. And in fact, this is the only place we can start. Now, I actually don't like this problem because they have you walking clockwise. No mathematician with their salt would ever walk around the circle clockwise. We would always walk counterclockwise. But for this problem, they want us walking clockwise. So in this configuration, there was a starting point such that as I walk around, bless you, I never see more yellow dots than white dots. The question is, is that always possible? No matter how you put down the dots, will there always be a starting point so that you can walk around and never have walked through more yellow dots than white dots? So does everybody understand the statement of the problem? Okay, so, okay, so you shook your head no? But I have a question. Yes. Yes. So I want to choose a starting point, and as I walk, I'm going to keep track of how many yellows and how many whites. And so let's say I start here. I would be one yellow, I'm sorry, one white, no yellows. Then here I'd be one white, one yellow. Then I would be two whites, one yellow. Three whites, four whites, five whites, one yellow. Five whites, two yellows. Five whites, three yellows. Five whites, four yellows. It's getting close. Six whites, four yellows. Uh, six whites, five yellows, six whites, six yellows. I know by the time I get back to where I started, I have to have the same number of whites and yellows. And I want to walk in such a way that at no point have I ever seen more yellows than whites. Right. We leave it as an exercise to the reader why you might care about this. Is it possible to do this? Is there some place to start? Tell me what must be true about your starting place. has to be white. All right. If you start on the yellow, clearly you've already lost. All right. So we know at least that. So can you walk and never see more yellow than blue, ah, uh, than white? Note. Start on white. So I, I'm teaching linear programming right before here. That class is all about efficiency. How many starting points are there? N. So if each one of them I can just start and see if it works. How many ways are there to put down yellow and white dots on the circle? Too many. Too many. Let's quantify this. How many ways can I put them down? Without loss of generality, we might as well assume that you know, at one point we start off with a yellow dot up here. Because the circle has symmetry, we can always rotate it up. So we're going to start off with a yellow dot here. And now we have how many blocks left? N. Not n. n I'm sorry? N Two n minus one blocks. And we choose n of them to be white. So that's the number of ways. This is going to be approximately the middle binomial coefficient, which is going to be approximately, I think, about like 2 to the um, 2n, and maybe like divided by n, something like that. Well, I mean, if I want to estimate it, but I mean, if I look at, you know, x plus y to the 2n minus 1, this is the sum of x to the k, y to the 2n minus 1 minus k, uh, 2n minus 1 choose k, k goes from 0 to 2n minus 1. If I take x equals y equals 1, I get 1 plus 1 to the 2n minus 1, 2 to the 2n minus 1. So if I sum all the binomial coefficients, I get 2 to the 2n minus 1. The middle binomial coefficient is the largest. 
And so it, it should be somewhere between this, somewhere in that range, roughly. Many, many possibilities. You know, if n is 2014, you don't want to write them all down by hand. So the question is, how would you attack this problem? One thing is to just do a bunch of cases and try to get a sense. Any thoughts as to how we could attack it? Yes? I don't know if this is relevant. Okay. If you have a path, and this is kind of, yep. if you have a path, like your starting point, yep. um, and it's such that um, when you walk clockwise, you never see more yellow than white, mm -hmm. then if you start right to the right of it and go the opposite direction, you'll never see more white than yellow. Okay, so let me write that down very carefully. So we want to have we have a path going clockwise, and what do we see? I never see more yellow than white. Never more yellow. But that's what we want. I mean, if we have a path like that, we've won. <laughs> okay, and then you're saying what, if we go in the yes, other direction? A corresponding, so if you have one of those, then there's a corresponding path. And what, what's true about going in the other direction? And so now if I go counterclockwise, what's true about the counterclockwise? <coughs> it's not necessarily true, I think. If, you, if you're right in the middle of a, of a bunch of yellow beads, it's not true. Oh, you're right. Right, right. yeah. Sorry. So, so, the, so the problem is, it's very nice to try to think, well, maybe if I go in the other direction, but it could be completely wrong. So the idea here is, you know, if I have a bunch of you know, whites over here and a bunch of yellows, I'll have the yellows as open, I can have anything over here because maybe I have a huge reservoir of whites over here that keep me okay. So unfortunately, I don't necessarily know what's going to happen immediately before. What tools could be useful? Is this thing tool? Is this a problem for the arithmetic mean geometric mean? No. Um, I, I think I solved it with an inductive argument. Okay, good. Um, How would you do it by induction? The idea being that uh, if you could somehow assume that there's a successful pathway, then it's, it might be easier to show that just adding one more dot of each color, you can also get it. Good. So assume doable with NN. Now we study N plus 1, N plus 1. So we've added two more dots. We've added a blue, and we've added a red, or in the notation here, we've added a yellow, we've added a white. I could have put them anywhere. What I want to do is I want to look at dots that are not going to really hurt me. So when I have these two dots next to each other, what are the possible configurations? I claim I have to have this somewhere. So must have white then yellow going clockwise. Why must I have a configuration like that? Well, I mean, I, I don't know where I'm so Let's say we start at some white. So I, I could have, I could start off white, I could have a bunch of whites, I could have n plus 1 whites, but eventually I've got to have a yellow, I don't have just whites. So eventually I've got to have a white and a yellow. Let's look at the effect of something like this. If I'm coming into this, <coughs> if I have not seen more yellows than whites, as I come in through this, will I ever see more yellows than whites? No, I bump up the number of whites by one, and then I immediately move back. So I come back to exactly whatever I had over here. So if I was at W whites and Y yellows, I would go up to W plus 1 Y, and then W plus 1 Y plus 1, and then I would leave this at W plus 1 Y plus 1. Well, the, because I've added 1 to both, it doesn't really matter. So. I have this small little thing over here, which as soon as I go through it, it's as if it was never there to begin with. So I can look at my 2n plus 2 dots, 
and I take two dots that are next to each other that go white and yellow when I walk clockwise. And now I have two end dots remaining. Of the two end dots remaining, is there a place to start? Yes. Why? We assumed it by induction. So we should probably prove the base case. All right? Exercise. Base case. So I'll leave it as an exercise to try to figure out where you should start in the base case to make this valid. Hint. Okay. The base case is not that bad here. Then by induction, we're fine. So I, I really like this inductive proof. It's that you know, we have this little block that can be lifted out. This is a key idea in a lot of mathematics. I do a lot of research in something called random matrix theory. And in that, I really care about how things are matched. And what I often care about is I will have you know, um, a bunch of vertices on a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I have things matched in pairs. And whenever there's a crossing, it's bad. It causes a lot of difficulty. Whenever there's an adjacent matching, I can essentially lift that up and reduced to a picture of a lower cardinality, of a lower size. And essentially, that's what we're doing here. The idea in the induction is we want to lift this to something smaller. How can we lift this to something smaller? Well, we have to be clever and we have to note that we must have yellow, I'm sorry, white and yellow somewhere. What other questions could you ask now? Yes? What if, you have three colors? what if you had three colors? Will there always be a way to do it with three colors? Excellent question. You know, if I hadn't written the green chicken, that would be a question that would go on it. Now I can't use it for maybe two or three years, but maybe in four or five years, that could be a great question. What if you have three colors? What would be another question you could ask? So this said that there must be at least one path that works. How many paths? And then again, for the original configuration here, there was only one path, I think, that, well, no, we could start here, we could start here. No, we can't start there. We only had one path that worked. So on average, how many paths work? Is it normally distributed as n gets large? Uh, other questions? Oh, we're out of time. Nope, we have, we have a minute and a half. Other questions you could ask? Yes? Yep. Um, when you, at your starting point, um, your count is effectively like zero, zero before you start. Uh huh. So I think you can start at any point directly after you have two numbers that are the same. Right? Well, I'm just. I think what you need to do is you need to have regions that balance, I think, if you want to have multiple places to start. Because the real danger is if we shift over by one, it can't work. Because now we know we're ending on a white. So if I have a region of whites, the only one that could possibly work is the end. So if I'm going to have multiple solutions, I have to have a bunch of whites followed by an equal number of yellows. So it then becomes a nice question, how many ways can I arrange them so that I have a certain number of whites and a certain number of yellows? So this becomes a great question. This is a nice combinatorics question. Given you know, n whites and n yellows, how many configurations are there that have exactly one, exactly two, exactly three uh, possibilities? What's the average number? What's the fluctuations? If you know how to write some computer code, you can just experiment. All right, so uh, a couple of announcements. Project Euler, uh, for those of you who want to, and I know this is related to the course, uh, we thought it would be fun to have a Project Euler lunch. We did this last year. That's going to be today, noon admission in West Cafe, unless the language tables are there, in which case we'll move elsewhere. And then Math Puzzle Night will resume tonight at 530